On today's podcast, I talk with Andrew Herman. He's a central Wisconsin photographer who does weddings and senior portraits. We talked about how gear does not make the photographer. We also talked about his pet peeves in communication. Thank you for your listening and please enjoy. I'd like to welcome Andrew Herman to the podcast. Thank you for joining me, Andrew. Yeah, thanks for having me, Scott. All right, let's just start simple. Um, what got you into photography? Uh, I, I had a father that was really into astrophotography, so I spent a lot of my youth out in the dark with him with uh, actually some pretty large telescopes. So uh, we really learned sort of the extremes of photography, so to speak, under you know very challenging conditions. Um, I, I think I diverged a bit from that, and I really wanted to be more of a landscape photographer. But uh, he was very uh, influential with me when I was young in learning how to do photography, uh, understanding rules of composition, color, um, and just some of the technical aspects of it as well. Did you start with film? Oh, yeah, we started with film. Um, we did a little bit of medium format. <laughs> And um, of course, we graduated to di- digital now uh, in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, I never really shot film myself um, on a DSLR. It was more like, you know, point and shoot kind of wind up old cameras. Um, my first DSLR was, was digital, but um, yeah, I, I had an aunt that got me kind of into photography. So uh, way back in the late 80s and 90s. Um, so, kind of explain what uh, astrophotography is so some someone maybe that they wouldn't understand what it is well there's different i mean there's different types of astrophotography and they all really get lumped together but a lot of what you're doing is you're either in some way capturing night sky you're capturing deep space astrophotography which would be you know like galaxies constellations stuff like the horse head nebula um but you're dealing with such low light that a lot of these things are invisible in the naked eye even though they exist they're not really perceptible for our eye to pick up on them since the, the light levels are so low, even at night. Uh, so you really need some equipment, you know, using some long exposures to help bring that out for you. So you kind of started with uh, Astro and then got into landscapes. Um, what made you make the jump to wedding photography? Well, I, I shot my first wedding um in I believe it was 1997, and at the time it was it was just something I, I had some friends that needed uh, a wedding photographer, and it was a little beyond their budget. So I ended up, as most people did, I kind of got roped into the hit. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, I I I can clearly recall that there's a lot of high emotions that happened at a wedding, and I can recall the wedding very much. That I really enjoyed seeing two people that were in love. Um, and for me personally, I thought it was, well, how do you, how do you not just take their picture, but, you know, take the picture in such a way that you compose this in such a way that really demonstrates a lot of the emotions that happen throughout the day. Um, whether it's just, you know, a groom feeling a glance over at his bride when they're up at an altar together, or, um, there's a lot of these tiny little moments that can occur if you're observant. I guess you can say, uh, and, and if you have enough experience now, I think you can get yourself enough. Most of the times, be in the right position for these things to occur, um, and that's really what thrills me to this day. I, I initially, like, if you would have told me before I shot my first wedding, hey, you know, you're going to be a wedding photographer. Uh, I don't think that that would have appealed to me. When I was growing up, wedding photographer photography was very much in the dark ages, so to speak. I don't think it was until a lot of these um, movie stars and, and celebrities started to have these uh, extravagant weddings and publish them uh, and really kind of set a tone for how important uh, weddings are. Uh, and the wedding photography itself really kind of grew up, so to speak, and became a, an important aspect that people understood the importance of it at that point. Um, yeah, when, when I used to think about wedding photography 
way back before I even knew anything about it, I would just think, oh, the photographer stands behind this tripod. They have some lights and flashes. Everybody stands in front of the camera. They say cheese and you move on and that's it. And they're only there for like 20 minutes after the ceremony and everything's taken care of. You get like maybe four or five pictures and that's it. You know, it's completely not that. <laughs> um, talk yeah. about like, talk about your, your process throughout the day. Like um, you and I shot a wedding together um, this, this past summer, um, actually fall. And it was, uh, you know, it's an all day event. You get there in the morning and you go home at night, but talk about your, your booking process and what, what you go through with your clients. Like, how do you, how do you book them, get them to, uh, you know, pay your price like you, um, just things like that. Well, I, I think that's the challenge for both photographers, videographers, or for clients, um, is that we're all trying to find each other, both at the right skill level that will capture in the right way and at the right price point. And um, as you know, photographers and videographers, we're looking for the right client just as much as uh, those clients are looking to find us. Um, as yeah, I, I think definitely. that I, I don't, I don't think that I just show up and I do, you know, a wedding photography for a client. In many ways, there's, there's a collaboration that occurs there. And that begins during that first contact when we talk about, um, you know, what are you looking for in your wedding? You know, how many people are going to be attending? Um, and you try to get uh, an, an, an intimate understanding of who these two people are, you know, why they're in love, or how do they meet, um, without without being intrusive, I guess you can say. You, yeah. You do want to talk and get to know your clients, and then um, obviously as time, because usually with us we're booked sometimes many years in advance of these weddings, um, but then as you talk to your clients as, as the, in the days leading up to the wedding, we have um, we have an online what we refer to it as our wedding day timeline that refers to the, the wedding day. So our brides and grooms can go on there and they can leave us notes as to some of, some of it's informational, such as who the key players are, you know, mom and dad, um, um, who's going to be standing up in the wedding that we, we know the names of certain people when we get there so to kind of help better guide us. Um, but also where things are going to be occurring. So are you going to be getting ready at this location? Is the ceremony going to be here? Are we going to be stopping for photos there? Is there anything of interest to bride and groom? And we, we try to get information as to who the other vendors are that are going to be there as well. So there's a lot of organization that happens. And luckily we have that web so brides can kind of go there or grooms and fill in a lot of that detail leading up to the wedding so that we're, sl we're slowly building that as we go. Um, and then, of course, on the day of the wedding, um, a lot of that is meeting with them, making you know, ensuring that everything is going correctly. We always try to tell brides and grooms. The one thing that's always important is we always try to tell them if, if something goes wrong, uh, who's going to be the one to handle that situation? <laughs> um, and we always say the most, one of the most important things is that <laughs> neither the bride and groom should handle issues on their wedding day it should always be somebody else assigned on that staff uh, yeah if they have a you know a, pl a planner or a designated bridesmaid or, or groomsman that's definitely a good idea yeah you, know, you don't want to stress them out on their day exactly yeah, because we can we can do a lot of things with photoshop these days but if people aren't enjoying a certain portion of their day the photos may reflect yeah. that too so keeping them in their best spirits and that's part of what i believe people come together for on a wedding is not just to observe and, and be a part but to help the entire family should ensure that uh, this goes off the way that it needs to so yeah i always cover that too in our our pre-wedding inter um, interviews and meetings and you know who should be with who who shouldn't be with who just mm -hmm. stuff like that right as well as there's simple things such as when we're we're stacking people together for photos yeah sometimes exactly. there's family members that are uh, estranged from one another that may yeah. not may not want to stand next to each other and they're simple things but if we know about that in advance it helps us arrange people without having to stop and take note of that on the day to make a situation awkward you know yeah of course if or even if it just comes down to like asking whoever knows everybody 
because oh, yeah. unless you get like a picture ahead of time, there's really no way of knowing who Aunt, Aunt uh, Marge is and Uncle Bob, and they're not supposed to be together. You know, sure. just that kind of stuff. Yeah, I always I always look for a point of contact. You know, um, so kind of moving on. Who do you admire the most in, in photography? Like, do you have any idols? Do you have any someone that you aspire to get you know get inspiration from? Um, well, I think I think like the the typical answer is I I could give you you know numerous famous photographers or Brisson or you know I think Ansel Adams is a little cliched out at this point, but I I don't think what gets recognized a lot is that we have a lot of great artists today. And I think what's fantastic with digital photography, for better or worse, is that a lot of ordinary people can take some great photos. And uh, with social media, it's such a great combination of pairing. Um, so while I do have artists that I followed and that I've enjoyed, um, I think that there's certain people and just different friends that I've had that I'm amazed these days of what people are able to capture uh, with technology and equipment getting better all the time. Um, it's just amazing to see that there's things that we can capture today that would have been technically impossible or would have, you know, been one of those shots that you had to get lucky, so to speak. The things that we can actually, um, it used to be that if you looked at wedding photographers' portfolios <clears throat> in the 80s or 90s, they would be full of these, these once-in-a-lifetime shots, you know, where the photographer just got lucky, you know what I'm saying, where the sunbeams... Yeah hit a window behind him and had the sun rays were perfect, you know, but what's amazing today is that with, with some of the newer technologies that it, it, I think we're able to better pre-plan and, and recreate a lot of those shots um, that would have been very, very difficult to do years ago. So sorry for the long winded answer there. But, uh, oh no. no. Uh, that kind of leads me to my next uh, topic is um, what advice would you give to a new photographer just starting out? Um, I mean, the, f the first thing I would I would say is I think that somebody should have fun. I don't think if you and uh, we can talk about the technical aspect of how to improve. I think if you're enjoying yourself, you're going to want to improve. I think that's yeah. the most important thing is that finding that motivation because with any hobby, there will be some tough times. There will be times that you know people tell you you're not good or. You know, you make a mistake. And I think if you have passion and if you really enjoy doing it, you'll be able to muster the courage to fight through that. Uh, without that, that's when most people hang up the spurs. You know, it's like they have courage and they don't want to continue to feel, you know, uh, inferior in some way, you know, so they yeah. they stop doing it. <clears throat> so. that, I mean, that being said, there's just so much out there now with uh, YouTube and Facebook forums, and there's just so much educational material than there was in years past. I mean, even the last five years, if you YouTube, if you look up anything on photography on YouTube, you can pretty much find what you want on how to uh, change exposure, your shutter speed, uh, what ISO means, just anything from the basics to pretty far advanced mm -hmm. learning tools oh, yeah. on YouTube for free. I mean, mm -hmm. I learned how to use Lightroom from YouTube, you know, so yeah, I didn't. It, it's definitely, there's a resource tool that existed yeah. that didn't. And I don't believe that people need to go to school to be a photographer. And I, and I think that there's some people that may want a classroom setting. And for those that do, you know, I encourage yeah. them if that's the best way for them to learn, but it's definitely, there are no secrets out there. Uh, that you can't learn by a YouTube search. W with that said, I do want to take a note of that, that I think that most of the information that's out there regarding the technical aspects of how to do photography are very, very valid. Um, I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that you'll find on YouTube as far as how to run a business. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> definitely. So I do want to put that, that little caveat out there that going, going to school to learn business management, that's, yeah, that's definitely a must. Um, or at least employing someone or getting some sort of advice from someone that knows what they're doing for sure. I definitely would advise that. Um, but yeah. Or interning under someone. Yeah, that, that's that, it. That's, yep. 
not just a photographer, but a successful photographer. Because those are two different things. Because I know photographers who are above, you know, average, but they are very, very profitable. And I know photographers that are fantastic in their technique and they're not very profitable. So those are two very different aspects. So sometimes people get into yeah. photography because they want to, um, they want a business. And I don't think, I think that they, there's some people that they get so good with their photography that by the time it's, you know, when it's time for them to start turning it into a business, they're starting kind of from scratch where their business skills haven't evolved as fast as their photography skills. Um, and I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there in, in regards to business. So um, definitely like taxes, sales tax, all that is oh, yeah. can be really confusing if you don't get the right advice or right information from the start, you know, and I'm by no means an expert myself, but um you know, we all <laughs> we all have the battle scars there. Yeah, you know? definitely. So when you're and when you're a lot of a lot of mistakes that you make with business just cost you money because everything that you do costs you money. And you know, uh, there's still people today, you know, telling you that print mail works and you should spend six thousand dollars to send out print mails for people that don't even you know if you don't even own a studio and you have a physical location. There's just some advice that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in time. Yeah, I understand that. Like, yeah. I, I think you have to know your market without, you know, but I think that there's there's so many business advice right now that seems very specified to specific market trends, and it just doesn't seem to apply. Or a lot of the advice that you'll see is is stuff from like the 1990s that I don't necessarily know if it works for a photography business anymore. Even even digital email is going the way of what print mail is you know if you get a flyer or a mailing list from from somebody it's you know gonna get deleted right away or you can sort it so it doesn't get to your inbox or you know just that kind of stuff so social social media is fairly decent advertising of what we do for video and what i do for photo and um i found it to work and and the best i've found is word of mouth you know you do good for one client they refer you to their friend or their family member and then you do good for them and then they know people and it just keeps going in a chain chain reaction like that so um i find find that the best yeah that's definitely the, the best way when you can create organic uh leads that way i mean you have to create a vessel for people to to create those referrals but um when people are satisfied with your work um, and they had a good experience, um, they're going to, you know, want to refer you. And speaking yeah. of experience, I mean, it's, it's, it's odd today because with this latest generation, what we find is that we're no longer in, in a product based business. We're in an experience based business. Brides, uh, when we talk to them, they don't want just photos. I mean, they want, yeah. they want an experience. Um, and it's uh, it, it's very very interesting how that market has shifted. Yeah, and that's that's that could be a whole other topic for another day. So I don't yeah, to get off on definitely. This. So two more things I wanted to hit on. Um, what what advice do you have to cinematographers, videographers um, that you've seen or worked with um, alongside during a wedding? Um, I mean, communication is always the best, but anything else that you've seen, like, um, yeah, the, well, you, well, you hit on the communication aspect. That's the most important. I, I think when it comes to giving advice to photographers and cinematographers in regards to working together, um, we need, we need good communication between each other because we're all trying to get the best shots and we need to find ways to yeah. cooperate with them instead of competing with each other. Um, Cause I've seen some, some pretty odd things in my days that just don't, you know, yeah. seem a little odd, but, uh, yeah, we, we clicked, we hit it off pretty well. So yeah. one video or the one video, one wedding we did, um, kind of, kind of figured out each other's personality pretty quickly there. Yeah. So, well, and a lot of what, what we were doing with you and I together was, you know, we have, it's always working in limited time, limited yeah. days. So it's like, well, let's, you know, where we have to take pictures it's let's see where the light looks good what's going to be an interesting backdrop 
Um, and we, I, we were able to collaborate on, I think it was even some detail stuff we did with the shoes and different items. Yeah. You know, so we were able to, to, to get some of those important shots out for the brides. So. Um, but it's good that we're able to work together on those things. So, Yeah. So, and then um, probably what's, what other services do you offer other than wedding photography? And um, the last thing that I, that I had on my list of things to talk about was uh, what's your biggest pet peeve on a, on a wedding day besides no communication? Cause that's my biggest pet peeve. No communications between all the vendors. Um, what would be your biggest? Well, we, we offer wedding uh, portraits and senior photographies. Uh, I don't consider myself a general or generalist photographer. We really do consider ourselves specialty photography team. Good. Um, Good. As far as pet peeves, man, <laughs> I, I hate to I hate to, to sound like a broken record, but uh, communication <laughs> is uh, that 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 will cause more damage to a wedding than anything else. Um, there's just little things that can occur. I mean, the, the, as much information as as we can acquire. Um, that's so important. Um, even, you know, because weddings are so fluid. We've had so many things that will change at the last oh, moment yeah. where things go here, things go there. Um, but as long as we're all on the same page with everybody, things seem to flow well. And I understand sometimes it's very difficult for a bride to get information to uh, so many different vendors because there's a lot of different information. And there's things that, you know, that, for, you know, that don't seem as important, such as, um, what time the dances are going to be occurring. That yeah. I think brides think that that might be something she wants to tell the DJ. Well, well, sometimes we need to know about that too, so we can ensure any type of lighting or gear we want to set up for them, that we have that done in time. So, yeah, it's, it's always fun when you walk into the um, the reception venue, and you, I walk right up to the DJ right away and go, "So, what's going on?" And they go, um, "I'm not. I don't know. I'm not sure." And then you go, oh, now I know how this is going to go the rest of the night. Right. You know, or it's really works out. It's really nice when they go, yep, it's going to happen right now. I'm going to talk to whoever. And then you kind of go, okay, now it's the DJ show. And you let them kind of take over. And as long as they're telling you, you know, the speeches are happening this time, the first dances are happening here. Um, we're doing this special dance here. Everything seems to work out really nice. But yeah. When brides don't give you that, that much information, I think as long as all the vendors are communicating, we can get along and we can formulate a, a plan together. Yeah, yeah, Maybe. definitely. So as long as we're dealing with, uh, I hate to use the words, but experienced vendors, uh, it's important because people that know how to, how to be pliable like that. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, we've showed up sometimes where we get there and we're told, uh, you know, there's going to be a certain timeline and we literally walk in the reception and we told we have two minutes to set up. Um, and obviously that's going to, that's going to be a little bit more limiting when we have that yeah. kind of time to prepare. So um, sometimes we're able to talk to a bride and see if we can get a, a five minute extension. Sometimes we can't, but you know, it's still their wedding day. So however they want to let that day flows up to them. Nice, nice. So, is there anything else that you got coming up that you'd like to plug? Any workshops that you're doing, um, shows that you're going to? Uh, we're doing some training to? with with photographers this year, so we're going to be doing a few workshops uh, that's going to revolve around uh, bridal portraiture as well as uh, off camera lighting. Uh, we don't have any dates set for that. That's going to be we're going to be holding at least two of those workshops, and that's going to be for people that are interested in being wedding photographers, already established wedding photographers looking to add some uh, some more types of uh, weapons to their toolkit, so to speak. Do you have a like a location that you're going to be doing it at? Do you know? Uh, we do. We have two locations, but we're not ready to make any announcements yet. So. Cool, cool, cool. And the last question everyone wants to know, Canon or Nikon? <laughs> uh, I know the answer. Yeah, well... <laughs> You know, I think I think that there's a joke that could be said here, but the reality of it is is well, first off, no Sony, huh? Oh, uh, yeah, Sony, I got yeah. that one. No, um, it's 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 2019, and uh, I think if you can't, if, if people need to take a little bit more accountability, if you're not getting the shots that you want with the gear that yeah. you have, very very often it's not the gear that's at fault; it's an education issue. 
Yeah. Um, it's definitely not the gear that makes the photographer. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure. Because we, the left even though we, we both agree that Canon's better. Uh, just and well. <laughs> <laughs> Topic for another day, my friend. But, you know, you know, you're, you know, if, if just you trying to bait you. That's all. Enough, I'm just baiting you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you use gear long enough, I don't know if it really matters what the logo yeah, is on the front. As long as it's getting you the shots you want, a lot of it comes down to what you get comfortable using. Because, you know, once you get comfortable using one brand, it's difficult to use another one because whether it's the button placement or the way they feel in your hand, it just feels a little awkward, you know? Well, the, the Canon lenses and Nikon lenses, their focus and their zoom are opposite from what I understand. I've, I've never... I never really touched a Nikon lens, but like that would throw me off right away. If the the zoom was the opposite way, you know, I would just be thrown off completely. Like, oh, how do I do this? You know? Yeah, that's not something I think that I hit on too many times. So, I, yeah. I, I mean, in the heat of a moment, I, I think like once you learn, because I have some lens that I think focus or zoom one way, and then some. I have some off-brand lenses too, mm. and I yeah. think you just build muscle memory with that gear. And after you take it out shooting a couple times, you just, it, it's not a conscious thing, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I'm not aware of, of which direction I'm spinning a lens. Like if I picked up, I couldn't tell you which direction any of my lenses spin right now. It's just all muscle memory. To any time, so, Yeah, I suppose that, I think about it, whatever, whatever, um, whatever gets the job done, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because right now, I mean, the truth is that the kit lenses that are coming with cameras today, you know, the ones that we all like to make fun of, <laughs> those kit lenses are sharper and better made than what Ansel Adam was using in a lot of his gear. So, you know, in that regard, it's, and I understand that there are still some circumstances that gear is going to help you out of trouble, you know, but for many, many things, I, I don't necessarily know if the gear is always to blame if you're unhappy with where your shots are. A lot of that's more education, I think. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining me. And uh, it's been a pleasure. We'll probably have to do another one because we did hit on a couple topics that would make um, some good material for another podcast. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Scott. All right, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah. Take care.